This program is brought to you by 3CTV. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up on the latest 3CTV programs. Hi, I'm Lynn Mann presenting to you Microsoft Excel 2013, Common but Tricky Functions. Most users of Microsoft Excel, whichever version, know it's an incredible tool able to compute complex and complicated calculations using hundreds of functions Excel provides us. These built-in functions make our life a little easier to some degree, but when the function doesn't output what we expect, or using the function is complicated, then frustration can arise. Today, I'll try and lessen that fr frustration by giving you some insight on how to use Excel's common functions. Although I'm using Excel 2013, this video is definitely valid for 2010, 2007, and 2003 versions of Excel. Let's lay down some groundwork. What is a function and what is a formula? In mathematics, these words are pretty interchangeable. In Excel, these terms have different meanings. A formula is a statement written by the user to be calculated using at least one mathematical operator and numerical values, cell references, defined names, functions, or a combination thereof. Mathematical operators would be subtraction, addition, division, multiplication, and exponentiation, which is, for this, caret. Formulas can be as simple or complex as the user wants. So a formula would be 1 plus 2 plus 3, which our formula outputs 6, or A1, 5, times B1, 6, which the formula result is 30. A function, on the other hand, is a piece of code designed to calculate specific values. The syntax for using a function is the function name, open parentheses, any required and or optional arguments, and then the closed parentheses. Some functions don't require arguments, so therefore the syntax would be the function name, open parentheses, then immediately the closed parentheses. For example, we can take this 1 plus 2 plus 3, and it would be the function name of sum, parentheses, 1, 2, 3, which would be the same function result is a 6. Or, like B1, or A1 times B1, we use a function name product, A1, comma B1, which that function result is 30. They do have something in common. Whether you're using a formula or a function, you must always start with an equal sign. This equal sign tells Excel, get ready to do some math for me. One of the keys to using Microsoft Excel's functions is to use them efficiently. If you tell Excel equal sum parentheses 1 plus 2 plus 3 end parentheses, you will get the right solution of 6. But you just wasted Excel's computing power and your time. For equal sum, parentheses, 1 plus 2 plus 3, in parentheses, this is what Excel does. Excel sees the equal, telling it to get ready to do some math stuff, and then it sees the sum function. It goes to its function library and gets the sum function and puts the function's code in its memory to use then Excel sees the 1 plus 2 plus 3, and it does that math, giving it the result of a 6. Then it passes 6 to the sum function, and it does its thing, which adds up a single number of 6, and then outputs 6. Okay? But we just made Excel do a bunch of extra work that it didn't need to do. It had to go to its function library, call up the sum, put it in its memory, run through all of its code, all for nothing extra. When Excel did the step of 1 plus 2 plus 3, it already had the solution, that is 6. Doing this once won't slow Excel down, but imagine making Excel do all these extra little steps for hundreds and thousands of calculations. That tiny bit of time adds up and slows Excel down. In essence, efficiency is lost. On top of that, and more importantly, 
Think about all the extra work and time and effort you put in when it wasn't necessary. A more efficient way of doing this would either be the 1 plus 2 plus 3 output of 6 or the sum function 1 comma 2 comma 3. Either one of these would have been more efficient. Now that we have that under our belt, let's get to chatting about some common functions that can get tricky to either understand or implement. Several of Microsoft Excel's financial functions can be very confusing to use. They're named very similarly, but what they calculate is very different. Their arguments are not quite straightforward to use either. Let me preface this with, I am not a financial wizard, nor do I make my living doing anything in the financial world. So my explanations of these functions are as a layman or an outsider looking in. With that said, these are what I like to call the PMT plus one functions. We have the PMT, the PPMT, the IPMT, the ISPMT, the CUMIPMT, and the CUMPRINC. What do all these functions calculate? The PMT, that will calculate a payment for a loan. The PPMT returns the principal amount of that payment. Well, part of your payment goes to paying back the loan and part of it goes towards the interest. The PPMT will tell you how much of your payment goes towards paying back the loan. The IPMT will tell you how much is going towards interest. The ISPMT, it does the same thing as the IPMT except that it's LOTUS 123 compatible. The CUM IPMT will calculate the interest that is paid back during a given period range, meaning you have a start period and an end period, and it calculates how much interest you paid over that period of time. Whereas the CUMPRINC, that calculates how much went back to paying off the loan during a period of time. Here we have a scenario. We're going to take out a loan for $249,990. Could be a house, could be a very expensive car, could be a credit card. Don't care what the loan is, but it is a $249,990 loan. The annual interest rate is 5.125%. The length of the loan in years is 30. And let's say we make a payment every month. And the other two I'm not going to worry about right now, but eventually the future value is going to be zero. We want to pay off this loan eventually at the end of the loan. So let's figure out what our payment is going to be at the end of our pay period. So to do that, it's going to be equal PMT, our rate, but again, this is the interest rate per period. So we make 12, this is the annual rate divided by 12 because we make 12 payments a year. The number of periods is going to be the 30 years times however many payments we make a year. So that's 12. I'm using everything that I have on my sheet. The present value is how much our loan is for, $249,990. Our future value, you can omit. If you omit it, it's going to be zero, but I'm actually going to use it just for argument's sake. So we have zero here. And our type is going to be a zero. If we leave this out, it's at the end of the period by default. If we put a one, it's at the beginning of the period. So for argument's sake, I'm gonna complete it by using a zero. So our total payment is going to be $1,361.16. This is our payment every month for 30 years for a total of 360 payments. Of this payment, let's figure out how much goes towards paying back the loan on the first month of the 14th year, which would be 157th payment. So the PPMT is perfect for what we need. PPMT, again, the rate is the monthly rate, so it's the annual rate divided by 12. Our period is going to be our 157th period. 
The number of total payments is going to be our 30 years times 12. Our present value is our amount of our loan. Future value I'm going to go ahead and leave out because it's going to default to zero and type is going to be zero as well. So of this on the 157th payment, $570.61 goes towards paying back the loan. Let's figure out how much of that payment is interest. Well, it should be the payment minus how much goes towards paying back the loan. So I'm going to expect $790.56. Let's see if it's true. Equals IPMT. The rate, again, is always the annual rate divided by how many payments a year. And we make 12 for this loan. The number of period would be the 157th period of our loan. How many total periods we have? 40 times, or sorry, uh, 30 times 12. The present value is the amount of the loan. And again, I'm going to go ahead and leave off the future value. That defaults to zero, and the type defaults to zero. Again, perfect. It turned out perfect. Now, let's try all of this, the PMT, the PPMT, and the IPMT, where we make the payment at the beginning of the period versus the end of the period. It's going to make a slight difference. So, equal PMT. The rate, again, is the annual rate divided by however many payments we make per year. The number of payments is going to be how many years times the total amount of periods per year. Our, future, our present value is the amount of the loan. Our future value is going to be zero. I'm going to go ahead and leave that blank. So I'm just going to do two commas in a row. And this time it's at the beginning of the period. So the type is a one. Perfect. And let's see what the difference is. If we take the one amount minus, the difference is about $5.79. Over a loan, 30 years of loan payments, that can certainly add up. So let's see again what the principal payment going back to pay the loan on our 157th month, but making the payment at the beginning of the period. So PPMT, everything is the same except the type is a one versus, pardon me, <clears throat> versus a zero. The period is the 157th. The number of total periods is 30 times 12. P the uh, loan amount, present value. Again, future value, we can put the zero in there or we can omit it. And then at the beginning of the month, or beginning of the period, so a little bit less goes towards paying back the principal. Why is that? Because when you pay at the beginning, no interest has accrued until the end and you didn't pay any of that interest back. That's kind of how it is, how I see it. Again, I'm not a financial wizard, but that's my understanding of how these work. The IPMT is going to be the same thing, except the type is going to be a one. Here we have interest rate divided by 12. The number of the period is 157. And the total number of periods is 30 times 12. And the present value is the loan amount. And again, it's type 1. So just slightly different. Less goes towards. Now over the period of the loan, these two amounts are going to add up. For example, let's see what the difference is going to be. It's going to be the loan amount times 30 years times number of payments per year. And let's figure out what it's going to be for the beginning of the period times 30 years times 12. And the difference oops, it's a difference of $2,083. That's a fairly big difference if you make your payment at the beginning of the period versus at the end of the period. Okay, the ISPMT is Lotus 123 compatible and it does have fewer arguments than the IPMT. You can't choose what type and it assumes that the future value is always going to be zero. So it's ISPMT. 
the rate, again, annual rate divided by the number of payments, the period, 157, the number of periods, 30 times 12, and the present value, $106 versus $790. It's a slight different calculation in the background. Uh, I don't know which one's better or which one's worse, but it is a slight different calculation. Now let's figure out between the 157th and the last payment how much interest rate we accumulate and how much principal we accumulate. So it's going to be equal C-U-M-I, P-M-T, the rate again is always the annual divided by how many payments we make every year. If we only made four, we would divide it by four. The number of total periods, 30 times 12. The present value is our loan amount. The start period, let's say 156, or pardon me, 157. And our end period is going to be the, our 360th. And this type is a zero. I'm just going to copy this so it looks better. $92,000. And of course, our principal, C U M P R I N C, it's basically the same thing that's in the C U M I M P, I P M T. So the rate, number of periods, 30 years times the 12. Our present value, our start period, 157, 360 is our last, and our type is a 1, or is a 0, pardon me. Let me just double check, make sure that I did a 0 right there, and I did. Okay, so our principal, $185,000 goes to paying back our principal, basically this, almost the second half of our loan. Now, if we wanted to know exactly half of the loan, how much goes towards interest, and half of it goes toward, and what goes towards paying it back, we can change the 157 in this, which is C3, pardon me, C7, we can say, okay, halfway through the loan is 180, and halfway through the loan, so the last half of the loan, I pay $75,000 in interest and $171,000 to paying back the loan. So you can see the majority of the loan is paid back the second half. And I'm just going to fill these in with the type 1. So again, if it's type 1, we have a little slight difference. So it's $74,000 going back to interest and one seventy dollars going to back to paying off the loan. But again, overall, if you pay at the beginning of the term, you're going to pay less overall, about $2,000. So that does make sense that there is a slight difference here. So let's recap. PMT calculates a payment for a loan. PPMT returns the principal part for a specific period. The IPMT returns the interest for a specific period. The ISPMT does the same thing, but it's compatible with LOTUS 123. The CUMI PMT calculates cumulative interest between two periods, and the CUMPRINC is the cumulative principal paid on the loan between. When I teach Microsoft Excel, there is a function that seems to give students the most difficulty, which is the if function. The if function is a logical function that is used to test information to see if that information meets a certain criteria. If it is true, there is something that happens if it's true. If, it is, if that test is false, then there is something else that happens if, if it is false. To better understand an if function, we should look at it from the point of view of the Cuban perspective. So let's look at a decision tree. A single if statement, or Excel's if function, is composed of a test and two outcomes. One, if the test is true, 
can 1 if the test is false. Here's an example of an if statement. If a person is 18 or older, if that's true, they are an adult. If it's false, they are a child. There's only one true and one possibility for a false. Here's an if statement you're probably very familiar with, which is a typical grading scale of A, B, C, D, F. So what this does is it takes in a score and it tests to see if that's greater than or equal to 90. So 90 to 100. If that's true, you get an A. If it's false, it has to test some more. So the next test is, is the score greater than or equal to 80? Well, you might think that it's seeing if it's 80 to 100, but it's not. It's really testing to see if it's 80 to 90 since we already took care of if it's 90 and above, it would have popped out of this. So if it's true, if the grade is a B, if it's false, we have to test. Is it 70 to 80? It's 70 to 79. If it's true, it's a C. If it's false, we test some more. If it's between 60 and 69, if that's true, you get a D. Otherwise, it's less than 60, and if it is a false, so it's an F. Let's build a few if statements to try and get it down into Excel logic. Here's our scenario. We want to know if our actual expenses are above our predicted expenses. If they are, we're going to pop out over budget. If not, we're going to say OK. So let's build a few of these. So equal if. What is our test? Our test is, is our actual expense greater than our predicted expense? If it is, we want to pop out the words of over budget. And text is always in double quotes. If it is false, we're going to say it's OK, or we could say within budget or something like that. So again, just looking at it from a human perspective, is 900, is 1500 greater than 900? Yes, it is. So we better see something that says over budget. And indeed, it is over budget. Now, let's see if our next one equal our A3 is greater than uh, our predicted expenses. Again, if it is, we're going to say it's over budget. And if it's not, we're going to say it's OK. Now, looking at it from a human perspective, this better pop out OK. A3500. And indeed, it does say OK. Now let's try to put in that grading criteria down as an if function. So here are the formulas, but let's build these to see what our live result is. So equal if. If our score is greater than, in this case, let's say our grading scale. We could say greater than or equal to 90, but we'll just say greater than 89. It is an A. Otherwise, we have to test to see if it is greater than 79. So we'll get, it is an if. This is called a nested if. Our test is going to be our A12 is greater than 79. If it is, it is a B. This is strictly greater than, so we don't have to do the equal to. If it is not a B, it could be a C, D, or F, so we have to test again. Our logical test is our score oops, greater than 69, strictly greater than. If it is, it is a C, else it could be a D or an F. So we need at least one if statement more is greater than 59. I did that right. Yes. If it is, it's a D. Otherwise, it's an F. How do I know how many ifs I need? How many outcomes do I have? I have A, B, C, D, and F. I have five outcomes. I must have four ifs. 
And then of course I close all my if statements. And if I did it correctly, a 45 would be an F. I'm gonna build one more. Instead of doing the strictly greater than, I'll do it in terms of the flat 90, 80, 70, 60 scale. So I'll build this very quickly. Equal if, if my score of 90 is greater than or equal to 90, then they get an A. Else, if, remember I don't know what their scores are ahead of time, so I don't want to just say, oh, it's an A and pop out. I want this to be able to change depending on what my values are. So if my A13 is greater than or equal to 80, then I'm a B. Else, I better be another test. I have to see if I'm a C, D, or F is greater than or equal to, uh, what am I on, 70, then I'm a C. Otherwise, I have to do another if, because I still have a couple of more choices, a D or an F. If it's greater than or equal to 60, then I'm a D. Otherwise, I have no other choice. I'm an F. End all my parentheses, and it's an A. Now that I have that function done, I can just drag it down to the next one, and I am a C. Does this make sense? 78? Yes, that would be a C. Here's another quick example. Let's say we want to know if our data, which is in A24, is it within our budget or over our budget? And let's say our budget is, is 100. So if I'm equal to or less than 100, then I'm within budget. So I'm going to say equal if my data, A24, is less than or equal to 100 then I am within budget. It's true, so I'm within budget. If it is false, if I was over 100, then I would be over budget. And it's within budget. So let's say if it was 102, this better change to over budget, and yes, it does. One more example of a very quick if would be just a flat out, hey, is this greater than this? So I want to say is 3 less than 1 if it is okay. If it's not, then go ahead. So if 3 is less than 1, then it's okay. But if I don't have a false value in there, I'm just putting a true. If it is true, it will spit out false. Okay, here's the difference. If I put comma and leave it blank, then it's a zero. It's just how Excel works with data. I am putting in an, a true value, but not a false value, and I'm not even saying do anything if it's false. It will spit out false. If I say 3 is less than 1, and I say, if that is true, say OK. If it is false, I'm not doing anything. It's going to spit out a 0. It's just a little thing you should know about when dealing with false statements. Do you want it to say false, or do you want it to say 0? These make a difference if you're using it in other functions to read out is it a zero. Let's summarize the if function. The if function specifies by a logical test to perform and then outputs a value if the test is true or if the value is the test is false. An if function can be very simple or it can be complex with nested if functions. Microsoft Excel 2013's Boolean functions are a wonderful addition to anybody's vocabulary of functions. I found this picture online and I thought it was a good representation of what each of these Boolean functions do. So for AND, basically if we have a cat that overlaps dogs, and in between here are cat dogs, and AND 
is this area of cat dogs. And or is basically everything, cat, cat dogs, and dogs. Let's say it's a cat, but not a dog. Therefore, not would be just this gray area of cat, not the cat dogs, and not the dogs, just cats only. And then an exclusive or are cats only, or dogs only, but not the cat and dogs. To better understand and, or, exclusive or, which is XOR, and not functions, let's look at the logic behind them. There's something called a truth table that can help us understand what our outcome should be. So I have two arguments. I'm just going to call them P, Q. So for the AND function, let's say P is true, Q is true. So therefore, P and Q is true. Let's try a second one. P is true, Q is false. Therefore, P and Q is false. So basically, for an AND function to be true, everything has to be true. Since Q was false in this instance, our outcome was false. Let's try another one. P is false. Q is true. Therefore, what do we expect? P and Q to be false. P is false. Q is false. P and Q are false. Both of them have to be true to have a true outcome. Now let's see the difference between an AND or an OR. P is true, Q is true, P or true, one of them must be true, therefore the outcome is true since both of them are true, then one of them at least is true. P is true, Q is false, P or Q outputs true. Why? Remember, we only need one of them to be true for the outcome to be true. This time P is false, Q is true, P or Q is going to be true. Finally, P is false, Q is false, therefore P or Q is false. None of them are true, therefore the outcome is false. Now let's look at the difference between exclusive or XOR. With XOR, one must be true and only one must be true. So P is true, Q is true, Therefore, P, X, or Q is false. Remember, only one of them can be true. Here we go. P is true. Q is false. Therefore, P, exclusive, or X, or Q is true. P is false. Q is true. Therefore, P, X, or Q is true. And finally, P is false. Q is false. P, X, or Q is false. That one's the most difficult to understand. It's a little backwards logic, but only one of them can be true, not both. And both can't be false. For not, it's just the opposite of what it is. So if P is true, not P would be false. If P is false, not P would be true. It's just the opposite of what's going on. So let's see a few of these in action. So let's start with and. Remember, all the arguments must be true to pop out a true. So, we'll do the easiest one. Equal and true, comma, true. Everything is true. I mean, I'm selling it, it's true. Therefore, our outcome better be true. Let's try one without one of our arguments to be true. So let's say it's and true false. I don't know. I could have as many trues in here. I can have a whole bunch of true, but I have one false. Therefore, because it's an and, since everything has to be true in there, I could have a hundred true and only one false, and it's still going to come out false. Now, here's one with a little bit more difficult of an argument. It's actually going to do something in there. So, and 2 plus 2 equals 4. Yes, that's true. 2 plus 3 equals 5. That argument is true. Therefore, our final statement must be true. Okay, 
You might use it that way, you might not use it that way. So let's get something that's a little bit more relevant about how you would use it. So here's an argument. Our first value, 50, which is an A11, is that value between 1 and 100? If it is, say it's true. If it's not, say it's false. Now this is not an if in here, it's just and telling it is it true or false. So equal and 1 is less than our value and our value is less than 100. If both of those arguments are true, it's true. Now here's an and in combination of an if. What we're using our and is our test evaluation of our if function. So we start off with if, and here's our logical test. This is where we're going to put all of our and. And is one less than our second value and our second value less than 100. So is our second value between 1 and 100? If that is true, remember that whole thing was our logical test for our if. If it's true, give me back my value that I gave you. If it's not, say that it is the value is, oops, is out of range. Okay, so let's take this one step at a time. Our if test is an and. Is our value of 104 in between 100, 1 and 100? Well, that should be false, so I should get the value is out of range. And indeed, it is false, so it gives us from the if statement, the value is out of range. Now let's try that again with our first value. So again, equal if, we'll give it our test of an and. One is less than 50, and 50 is less than 100. If that is true, that's our if statement test. If it is true, give us back our value. If it is not, say that the value is out of range. We expect this to be true, so we expect to get 50. And indeed we do. Okay, now let's try or. Remember, or only needs one of our arguments to be true, to pop out a true. So if we say or, true, false, false, false. Does it matter how many false I have in there? As long as I have one true, the outcome is going to be true. So let's try this one. 1 plus 1 equals 1. Well, that's false. And 2 plus 2 equals 5. Uh, that's false. So this or, there's nothing that's in there that's true, so it spits out a false. And then again, at least one argument in an or has to be true. So as long as we have an or, we can say 2 plus 2 equals 4, and I can have false, false. Again, doesn't matter that 2 plus 4 is a true, so it's going to give me true. Now let's use our same logical statements with our and for an or. So we had, is our 50 either greater than 1 or is it less than 100? So, or 1 is less than f11. Or is, actually I'm going to change it up and say f12, which is the 104, is less than 100. Well. Since the 50 is greater than 1, that part is true. 104 is not less than 100, that part is false. So the or really gets true comma false, and it comes out true. So I'm going to save a little bit of time here, and I'm going to cheat and copy my formula, and I'm just going to walk you through it. 
So this is going to be an if, and widen this out a little bit. So it's going to say, or is 1 less than 104? Well, yes, it is. So right there, it's true. It doesn't even have to go on anymore. But let's keep going. Is 104 less than 100? No, that's false. But it's still, since it's an or, it's going to say this whole part of the test is true. If it is true, give me back what's inside F12, which is 104. If it's not, it's going to pop out the value is out of range. But since it is true, we get 104. Again, I'm going to save some time and just copy my function here and walk you through it. Oops. Okay, so here's our test is a whole entire or of this if statement. So if F11, which is 50, is 50 less than 1? No. Is 100 less than F11? No. Because that's 50 as well. So is 50 less than 1? No. Is 100 less than 50? No. Therefore, those are both false. So it pops out a false, so it should be the value is out of range. And indeed it is. Let's work with XOR. Remember, XOR is that tricky one, that only one can be true. If both of them are true, it's a false. If it is one, is, one argument is true and the other is false, or all the rest of them are false, then it brings back true. If both of them are true, then it's going to come out a false. So it's just one true within everything else. So let's see this in action. Equal XOR is... 3 greater than 0, that's a true. Is 2 less than 9, that's true. Both of these are true, so the XOR wants one of them to be false, so it's actually going to pop out false. Okay, let's try the next one. Equals XOR, 3 is greater than 12, that's false. 4 is greater than 6, that's false. So both of these are false, so it's still going to come out false. Okay, I'm going to make up one on the fly. Equal XOR, 3 is less than 10, that's true. 8 is greater than 20, that's false. So this should come out to be true. One of them is true, the other, all the rest of them are false. So, let me try one more just to show you. We're going to say 3 is less than 9, that's true. 9 is less than 8, that's false. 8 is less than 7, that's false. And I can keep going, 7 is less than 6, blah, 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 blah. As long as only one argument is true, this will be true. Last but not least, let's talk about not. Remember, not just makes it the opposite of what it is. So if it's true, not is going to make it false. If it's false, not is going to make it true. So the simplest one is not false. What should it be? If it's not false, it's true. Equals not 1 plus 1 equals 2. That is true, but remember it's I hate to say this, but it's notting it. It's a not true, therefore it's a false. It's whatever it is, it's the opposite. Sometimes you want to use these in conjunction with if statements, so it's the opposite of whatever pops out. It, it's kind of a fast, dirty kind of trick to build if functions and use them in, in the sense of, well, if it's not this, then give me this. Let's review what we've covered. The AND function will return true only if all of its arguments are true. The NOT is reverse logic, so if it's true, it's false, if it's false, it's true. The OR will, re true, will return true if any of the arguments are true. Only one of them needs to be true for the whole thing to be true. An exclusive OR returns only true if one out of all of your arguments is true. Only one can be true. All the rest have to be false. 
Microsoft Excel 2013 provides us lookup functions, which in essence just goes somewhere, get, grabs information, and brings it back for our use. To understand these functions better, let's break them apart into each of its components. What they all have in common is it needs a lookup value. What is it going to look up? And then, where is it going to look it up? And what is it going to bring back? So for the lookup function, you give it a lookup value, you tell it where to go look up that value, and then bring back the value that's a result vector. So you only have two vectors to this. One to look up the value and a second vector to bring back the value. A horizontal lookup, an H lookup, you give it a lookup value, you give it a table so this is a two-dimensional table. Generally speaking, your column, pardon me, your headers for your table are horizontal. So it goes across a row. Then it says, bring me back something, which would be the row index. So if your headers are in a row, what you bring back is going to be in that row index. So let's say the row index is three, you go down three rows and you bring it back whatever's in that row. A range lookup means that it can look for an exact match or a near match. The only difference between a horizontal lookup and a vertical lookup is instead of your headings being in a row, it's usually in a column. What that means is it's set up vertically to look for something. So it looks down vertically to find that value and then it goes across however many columns you tell it to and it brings back that value. Let's take the lookup function. So the very first cell, A3, we have a lookup function but it's using an array. So basically what this array is A, B, C, D, and then in the next row it has 1, 2, 3, 4. So what Excel does is it looks up the value C and it's case sensitive, or it's not case sensitive, so it doesn't matter. It says A, B, C, C is the third one, so it says 1, 2, 3, and it brings back a 3. So let's play with this in the live lookup and I want to look up a C, and my array is in brackets, A, comma, pardon me, B, C, D, and then for my next row, it's colon, one, two, three, four. So if I say A, it will bring back a 1. If it's a B or anything there like a B, it brings back a 2, so on and so forth. Then it's bracket and parentheses. Okay. Now let's do this a little bit different. I have built a table, an array. It's the same thing. So I have A, B, C, D, and in the next row I have 1, 2, 3, 4. So if I translate this array onto my sheet, it would look something like this from E to H, uh, E3 to H4. So using this, I'm going to say this is actually uh, E3 to H4 would be my value, and it should bring back three equal lookup. My value I want it to look up is C, and where do I want to look it up? In this range, and it will be, bring back three. So depending on if you feed it an array within the function or you build an array outside the function, depends on how you give it the value. Here's an array that it's built vertically. So it's V lookup, or pardon me, it's lookup. And this time we're going to look up bump, something similar to bump. And it's going to be A, comma, 1, colon, 
B comma two colon semicolon C comma three. So it's going to be lookup, and I'm building the array within the function. So my func my lookup value is going to be bump. It's going to try and find something like bump, and my array is going to be A comma one semicolon B comma two semicolon and C comma three and I'm going to end my array end my function so it brings back a two it's looking for something like bump which would be B C is too far it's like the price is right it's looking for the nearest match without going over but again I don't have to build the array within the function, I can build it outside the function. I can also build the array outside of the function. So I have a comma one semicolon, which makes it a new row, b comma two semicolon, which makes it a new row, c comma three. So this array inside the lookup function, if you were to actually build it outside the lookup function, would look uh, vertical. So again, we're going to say look up something that's like bump in this array range. And I'm going to say, and again, it brings back two. Here's something that's fairly typical where we're going to take a grading scale and then we're going to look up a value. So, for example, we have the value we're going to look up, where are we going to look it up, which is this array, and what are we going to bring back, which is this array. So, equal, look up, what are we looking up, which is the score in A12, where are we going to look it up, and it's going to be in an array of 0, 60, 70, 80, 90, end array, and what's the result vector? So the result vector is, it's an array, so I have to put it in the brackets. A, pardon me, it's going to be an F, comma, D, comma, C, comma, B, comma, A, end array, end function. So a 45 is indeed an F. The same thing, I can build an array out here off to the side and still use a, the lookup function. So I can say equal lookup. There's actually two ways of doing this. Lookup value is my 45. And I could look it up in this range, comma, and bring back the result in the second range brings back an F, or I can say equal lookup. What's my value I'm looking up, and where am I looking it up? I can grab this whole entire range, and it assumes the second range is what I'm bringing back. So lookup is pretty clever. So again, it brings back my value that I wanted to bring back. I can do this for A13 and A14. So let's use the array, and I'm going to cheat and copy my function. And my live result again, look up A13, which is a 90. Look it up in this range of 0, 60, 70, 80, 90. And you match up the value with an F, D, C, B, or A. Since it's a 90, it lines up with an A. Or I can use this value out here. So again, look up my score. I can look it up in the range of E16 through I16. That's where I'm looking it up. And what am I bringing back? Will be E17 through I17. Brings back an A. Or again, I can say equal lookup. What's my value? My score, comma, 
Where am I looking it up? This whole entire range. Basically, it figures out, oh, I found a 90, bring back an A. Okay, and let's do it with the last value. Again, I'm going to, since it's a long formula, I'm going to copy. I'm going to paste. Oops. Sorry about that. Copy. Paste. Again, look up A14, which is 78. It's going to look it up in the range of 0, 60, 70. 80 is too much, so it's 70 range. And it says, oh, bring back the corresponding cell, which is a C. And again, it does it right. Or I can use this array of values out here off to the side. Equal lookup. Look up my value of 78. Where am I looking it up? My vector array. What am I bringing back? The corresponding cell. Or again, lookup is very clever. I can say look up my value of 78. Where am I looking up and what am I bringing back? It's very clever that way. Here's the same idea. I can either do it in a array style or I can bring it out onto my sheet itself and build some an array out of my area. But I do want to show you that if I wanted to build a vertical, basically what I'd have to say is 0F, 60D minus, each one of these is separated with a semicolon, so it would be 63 comma D semicolon, 67 comma d plus semicolon and then that would be a vertical setup and i can do that over here as well but i'll leave it as a horizontal setup again since this is a very long function i'm just going to grab copy enter and paste and i've got something wrong in here so i just want to double check what did i do wrong a23 should be A24. And it's a D minus. Again, I can use my table that's out here. So I can say equal lookup. What am I looking up? 61. Where am I looking it up? Again, I can either just pull this one top or the whole entire table, which I find is so much easier to do. Lookup is very, very clever. Again, I can pull this function, and again, I'm going to change the cell. Instead of an A24, 25, I get a C plus. The same function if I use my table out here. Look at my value, comma, use my table. Gives me the same result. I can either do the long way. If I didn't want to build something on my sheet, I could use this array style. Again, it's going to be A26. It's the only difference. Or I can say look up A26, comma, my table. Or I could say look it up in this range bring back whatever is in conjunction with this range. And I get the same result. That is the lookup function. It looks it up in one range and brings back another range. Let's take a look at each lookup. Each lookup is a horizontal lookup, which means here's some information that I have on my sheet. It runs from A2 to C5. It's going to look up in the first row of my table. And that would be axle bearing and bolts. And then it's going to bring back whatever is, if it finds what it's looking for, it will bring back something in the row corresponding to that find. What I mean by that is, let's say the first one we want to look up axles, and I want to bring back the second row of the table. So equal H lookup. I want to look up axles. 
I want to bring back, first I have to tell it where to go find it. So it's in this table somewhere. I want to bring back whatever is in the second row of the table. And I either want an approximate match or an exact match. And if I leave it out, it means find the nearest match. But I can say true, which is an approximate. And it brings back four, which means it found axles or something near axles and it brought back whatever is in the second row underneath axles. Let's do that again with bearings, but this time bring back whatever is in the third row of the table and I want an exact match. So equal H lookup. And I want bearings. I want to bring <clears throat> of the table. I need to check the table. I want to bring back the third row if I find it. And I want false, which is, means it's an exact match. And sure enough, it found bearings, went down three rows, one, two, three, and brought back the seven. So let's do that again, but with a near match. So equals H lookup. My lookup value is just going to be B. So it's going to find something close to B, but not over B. My table again. I'm going to bring back the third row. And I wanted to find a near match, not an exact match, but near. So this is what it did. It said, oh, I have axles, I have bearings. Bearings is greater than B, so I had to go back to axles and bring back whatever is in the third row of the table. That does not mean row three of my sheet. It means row three of my table, which would be five. And let's say H look up again. This time we're looking for bolts, my table, and I'm going to bring back whatever is in row four. Now if I said five, it doesn't exist, and I do need to spell H lookup correctly. It's going to bring back 11. Remember it looks horizontally for bolts. It found bolts, it goes down to the fourth row of the column. One, two, three, and four, and brings back an 11. Now we don't have to have the data on the sheet. What we could do is I'm going to cheat and I'm gonna copy and paste this function. And what this does, it says it's looking for a three in this array. So the array is one, two, three. Next row is A, B, C. Next row is D, E, F. And it's gonna bring back whatever is in row two. So technically it looks for three, which is in the third space, and it's gonna go down two. There's one, two, so it should bring back C, as in cat. And sure enough, it brought back cat. Now let's look up V lookup, which is slightly different than H lookup just by how it's set up. And I have several examples here, so I'm gonna start off with the first one. And some of these are quite complex, so, but I am going to go through these fairly quickly. So we want something that calculates the retail price of diapers by adding up the markup percentage of the cost. So I actually have two fee lookups. One is find using the item ID, find the cost of the diapers. Then with the markup, multiply the markup with it. So again, this time it's vertical. So it's gonna look, instead of horizontally, it's gonna look vertically for what we're looking for. That's the only difference between VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP. The VLOOKUP is going to bring back a column number, and then HLOOKUP brings back the row number of the table. Equals VLOOKUP. It's looking up D, I, it's a part number, 328. We're looking at this table right here, A2 through D7. Bring back what's ever in column three of the table, not C, but three of the table. 
I'm looking for an exact match, so it needs to be false. Multiply that, one plus, this is just mathematical formula, B lookup. Again, I'm going to look up the DI. Uh, let's see, 328. Where am I looking it up? I'm looking it up in the table. What am I bringing up back? The markup, which is in column one, two, three, four of the table. And I'm looking for an exact match. Again, I don't want a near match. I want to find exactly diapers, which is the DI328 value. And I say enter. Got something wrong here, so let me look. Had a spelling error, so I did fix that. So it's twenty-eight ninety-six. So let's see if that makes sense. Diapers cost twenty-one forty-five. We have a thirty-five percent markup. Twenty-eight ninety-six would be our retail price. Let's calculate a sales price of the wipes, which is W I nine eight nine, by subtracting the specified discount from the retail price. So. I'm going to cheat. This is a very long function, but I am going to walk through it. So we have our first lookup is find the wipes and we're bringing back the cost. That's column three. Then we're going to say one times the markup, which is in column four. And then we're going to take 20% off of that. And we get 573. Again, let's double check to see if that makes sense. So we have 512 with a markup of 40%, but then we took off 20% on top of that for a discounted price. Okay. Here's something a little bit more complex. We want to find the cost of an item that's greater than or equal to $20. Display the string markup is whatever the markup value is. Otherwise, display the cost is under $20. So, again, this is a very long formula. So instead of you watching me type it, I'm just going to copy and paste and walk you through it. So the first V lookup looks up whatever is in A3, which is ST340 and it brings back the cost of it, so 145.67. Is that greater than 20? Yes. All of this right here is the test for an if statement. If it is greater than 20, then you're gonna say markup is. The and is going to add that value to it. So 100 times whatever V lookup of our ST340, and we're going to bring back what's in column four. So all of this right here brings back our markup of 30%, which is in decimal format. That's why they had multiplied it by 100. So markup is 30, and for sand, the percent sign. So all of this, if it is true, whatever is here in the statement, if it's true, the markup is bring back 30. Percent. Otherwise, if it's false, cost is under $20. Well, we know this is true because the cost is $145.67. So the markup is 30%. Again, here's a very long if statement, and I'll break it apart for you. One error in there. I'm going to fix that. Okay, so here's an if function. All of this is the test of the if function. All of this is what happens when it's true, and all of this happens when it's false, value if it's false. So let's see. V lookup A4 in our table, bring back what's inside column three of our table. So BI 567. Bring back whatever the cost is in the third column. 
So it's 356. 356 is not greater than 20. So it's going to skip all of this true statement, but let's dissect it anyway. It's going to say the markup is, and then it's going to go look for the fourth, the, look up, the markup value, which is 40%, 0.40 times 100, so it's going to look like 40% if this was true, but it's not. It is false, so it's going to say the cost is dollar sign and whatever is in the third column of the table when we look up BI 567, so it brings back 356. So the cost is 356. The reason why we put the dollar sign there is because this is formatted in currency, but it does look like it's 3.56 in the cell. So here we go. Here's some more with the V lookup, and they're a little bit more complex. And you should really kind of try these out yourself and dissect them. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I am going to jump down and do this bottom. I think they're a little bit more simple, and we might be able to follow along a little bit easier. So I'm going to say equal V lookup one. Go find one in my table. Here's my table, and it's the density we're looking up. So we're looking down in this table vertically until we find one. If you find it, bring back the, vis the viscosity of that density. So that is the second column of the table. So what it's going to do is it's going to look down, find one as close as one without going over. So it looks at 1.09, that's too much, so it goes back to 0 0.946 and then brings back the viscosity for that density because it's just a near match, not an exact match. And sure enough, 2.17 comes back. Equal V lookup. We're going to look up one again in our table. We're going to bring back the viscosity. Pardon me, we're actually going to look, bring back the temperature and we're looking for a true match, which means, again, approximate match. I'm not looking for a perfect match, just near to it, but not going over. So I should bring back 100. And again, it brings back 100. Now, we look up. 0 0.7 in our table. We're going to bring back the temperature, which is in column three of our table. And we're looking for an exact match, which is false. Now, 0.7 is not on our table. So it's going to say, hey, I can't find it because you told me to look for an exact match. I have 0.746 and I have 0.835, but I have no 0.7 exact. That's why it's an error. Let's try another one, V lookup. Looking for 0 0.01, of course, in the same table. I'm looking to bring back the viscosity. And I'm looking for an approximate match. So again, it's going to look up what's the nearest thing to it. But the first density I run into is 0.4, which is greater than 0.1, so I should get an error. It can't find it, even if it's a near match. And again, I get an error. Last one, V lookup. I'm looking for a two in my table. Bring back the viscosity of that value of two. And I'm looking for a near match, not not an exact match. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to look, 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 and I get to 1.29. That's as high as I go. That's the nearest it's going to get. And it brings me back 1.71. So let's review what we did for lookup, H lookup, and V lookup. The H lookup looks across the top row of a table and then returns the value of the indicated cell. So it will look down the rows and find the value it needs to bring back. V lookup looks at the first column of a table, moves across 
and then finds the column that we want to bring back. A lookup is in a vector or an array. So we can look up one vector and bring back another value in that vector that corresponds either horizontally or vertically. If you liked this video, here are more that you might want to check out. Until then, I'm Lynn Mann. Be seeing you.